servicio para ese pasado nuevo centro. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Euro, and uh, I'm a designer. Nowadays, I call myself as a, a public school designer or a learning new things designer. And uh, at the moment, I'm uh, working in this uh, education technology company called 3D Bear. We do things with AR. So in the end of this talk, we are also going to try something out together, which is also a new experiment for me. And it, it's related to this topic I chose to talk about, uh, which is called random, random pairs. And um, I have, like for me, it's a really important thing that like, maybe it was three years ago when I just learned to me, like make methods myself in a way that like I just like start discovering something or like testing out ways to do stuff and then kind of turning them in uh, kind of repeatable things so you can also make a structure for it and then you can also explain it to others and I have also been doing some research about it but at the moment uh, Doing is more that I do than research, so let's see what's going to happen with that. But basically, random pairs, it's a um, concept that consists of randomness and pairs. And let's talk about them a little bit. Uh, when, when I was talk talking with Barbara, we had a really nice discussion about uh, like how these kind of concepts can evaluate. And, uh, uh, like come from something to turn to something else. And I didn't actually know that this Edward de Bono, who, ha who is a, a psychology guy uh, doing research about lateral thinking. So like that you shouldn't just like rationally think things, but you, you also can use your creativeness to uh, make better thinking. And he has used this method of like randomness or like he has said that you can use random words to stimulate new ideas, approaches, and patterns of thought. And he has this method of 20 words that he has chosen, and you can use them anytime you need uh, something new, and then you can check it out. It's really cool, and I just wanted to tell you that I'm not the first one to think of these things, but like, I didn't know about this. So like, some things are just in the air in a really nice way. And Randomness, it's like, I don't know, I don't remember when I realized that a randomness, r randomness is a really important tool for me, but in some point I just realized that many times when I have been doing something and then just like maybe it's switching to something else and then picking ideas from one project to another or changing my mindset in a way that doesn't make sense in that moment, that helps me create stuff. And I think it's something that many, many uh, creative people do, and they have their own approaches to it. And I think it's really important to talk about it, because then also people can get ideas like how else you can use randomness, because it's kind of endless possibility. But you have to curate it somehow. And uh, I chose to talk about my way to do it. Like, I, I do pairs. So basically, uh, there is like randomness, and then you choose to have two. Like you don't have one, but you have two. And that's the first rule. And then within these two, there is a lot of things that you can 
you can think about. And within these two, it's like uh, basically uh, you can like create stuff that fits the situation, makes it easier to ideate, makes better ideas. But there are certain things that like you get better when you get used to like curating the randomness. So you need some rules. Uh, or you can also talk about routine or practice or any kind of behavior. Like they say that a person needs 14 weeks to get used to something. So if you repeat something 14 weeks, then it's a habit. And then you do it that way. And also like if you are doing your work, you just like your brain cannot understand that. Uh, like you cannot make all the choices all the time. So basically your brain is gener generating habits all the time and you can, you can curate them by kind of turning the rules a bit or like making better rules in a way that you can, you can have more creative approach or you can have a more structured approach or anything. And this is a sentence that I wrote in my notebook when I was talking with Barbara. Rules are not always restricting, they can also give you freedom and uh, now when I'm working in a company that works uh, with pedagogical content for children, I have been thinking about a lot the idea that, like, um, that when there is somebody who has been doing something for a longer time, they have the possibility to curate the other people's behavior. And that's, some, some people call it pedagogy. <laughs> and, and my approach to that is that, like, always when, like you want somebody to be able to find things you you can kind of maybe restrict the content or you can choose the really narrow topic in a way that in within that topic you have enough time to to analyze it and kind of go deep enough in there and also like you can restrict it in material way like in a in a sense that you can kind of choose how how people approach the things like by giving them some tools and the tools kind of guide them and then within those tools they can be uh, more free to do stuff and it's also of course it's kind of a hierarchy in a way but i think it's like a, it's a good thing to think about like what are the things that you are really uh, that you you think you know something about and how could you help the others find more about that issue by curating their uh, approach or curating their freedom in a way that they, they, could, they could find more or better or anything you choose to concentrate on. And in random pairs, this is uh, the rules that we made in like with uh, actually with Hanna also, the, we had made this book about service design principles for uh, teachers and uh, the rules of this exercise that, that we have given to teachers so they can use it in classrooms is that you, you either have a pair or a group of two, four to six people and then you have cards which have words and the words can be like uh, we had in this book we have this example word so we have just like made boxes and then in the boxes there is school related words like table or pen or biology or uh, school restaurant or children or adults or, or scissors and then you take two words and then you turn them around and then you make an idea and it can be a stupid idea and, or it can be a really great and valid idea that everybody else has already thought about. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it doesn't make any sense in that point and you cannot know if it's gonna make sense in any point. But the idea of just like creating mass of things, like creating mass of ideas or creating mass of stuff that you can work on when you are doing the creative process is really important. And that's something I have been teaching to teachers that you don't need to know Actually, it's better. You shouldn't know anything when you are doing. And then, in some point, it starts making sense, and you just have to trust that 
in this point, more stuff is more stuff, and that's, that's all you need. And of course, sometimes you might get inspired, and it might be really fun, and sometimes it's frustrating, and, and it's, it's something that uh, it helps you to have these rules. So then the uh, teacher can use it, and then they can maybe modify it, make another kind of rules that fits better to things that they want to do. And when you curate, you can think about like the things be, be like inside this randomness that it can be like objects or it can be spaces or locations. It can be events in a way that like what kind of things could be related to the subject. And if you want to have like super randomness, then you just choose really wide things. And then if you want to take, like just think about pencils, then you just, just choose like super, super narrow perspective. But in a way, like just try it out. Curating randomness is really fun. And also <laughs> another thing you can think about is material choices. So basically uh, we made uh, one experiment with, uh, in design museum about random pairs that uh, I was just like, I chose some pictures that were related to um, Finnish design and uh, this kind of um, society or societal movements. And we made a workshop that I just printed this uh, kind of Polaroid size pictures with a slightly yellow tone. And there was, I think it, it was like 30 different pictures and we just printed them with the printing machine in, in this house. And then uh, we had scissors and glue and red yarn. And uh, it was an open workshop in this in design museum. And it was really interesting how people were inspired by this, uh, that they just got two random pictures. And then when they were working on it, kind of doing it, by manual labor, like sewing or cutting, it helped them to kind of think more about the idea. So actually, uh, it, you can also do it just not with words, but also uh, things that kind of make you think of something, like pictures or like some other materials or any ob objects or anything to just like randomly mixing them. So basically, it was. Uh, some people were using it in more like poetic way or, or this was like there was one picture of scissors and another picture of the box of, of like uh, voting. So that was uh, somebody who was from China and they ne never voted and they were thinking about the kind of Finnish design and uh, like voting system and democracy and, and uh, they were, it was really interesting to talk about that with them. And, and this other one was like um, some, I, I think it was about growing up. I don't remember exactly what, what happened, but I remember that this person was really kind of doing it in really consistent way and getting more, more ideas. And this was also, I think it was really interesting. I don't know if you recognize the house that is here, but I don't know, maybe it, something comes comes in your mind when you see it. And uh, nowadays I have been doing the same stuff with uh, uh, augmented reality. So before I was more doing with physical stuff or like cutting things and gluing and making this kind of using a lot of paper to create like uh, big prototypes with children. And nowadays I do the same with augmented reality. And I thought we could do a random uh, practice <laughs> like in, <laughs> in this end of the speech because I think it's really interesting how also uh, the ideas you have, you can just like choose to uh, work on them in augmented reality. So I can just show uh, there is this, um, I can, uh, how do you say, demo. Uh, how this works, and then we could do uh, this exercise of random hats. So basically, I will, I will just like create you some kind of hat, and I close my eyes because I don't want to know what I'm gonna take. Okay. 
we have uh, this kind of thing. <laughs> Let's see what kind of hat we can use for you. Okay. Let's put it that way. So how do you use this in the classroom or, or in some other, you know, this, this app? How would you apply that? Uh, well, I, yeah, I think I have a micro microphone here. Yeah, so basically, uh, of course, it depends on the class and it depends on the teacher and the students, what they want to do. But many times you can use it, uh, like, for example, when you want to ideate something uh, related to topics about, like, things you learn like biology or history or you can create scenes like if you have read a book and then you want to tell about it to somebody you can create a scene and then explain it that way or then you can use it in uh, like when you want to involve people in designing for example like in schools when you have a renovation coming or they want to make the school better so the kids can use like for example yesterday I was giving a workshop in a school where fourth graders were. First they were just marking places with, like you could put any kind of object with certain color and take a picture of that. Like green, green bear means that this place is nice. And then they showed it to others. So it's kind of just way of marking, like putting a sticker on a, on a photograph. Or then you can use it like uh, creating like ideas and uh, showing them to others and discussing because many times children are like they cannot maybe draw so fast or or they don't like drawing or they just don't like school so it helps <laughs> yes thanks of image bank do you have for example when you when you told that uh, kids in school could help for some specific uh, subject let's say uh, other different things in this uh, environment for example if they would uh, be learning history about some let's say prehistorical period and what objects you might have there so that it really would uh, make it possible to do it that well that's a thing that <laughs> <laughs> we have been uh, like thinking about it a lot and we think that the teachers are best curators in that sense. So now actually teachers can create galleries so you can just choose 3D objects and nowadays there is over one million free objects you can find online and you can also order them for free, really free so if you, or like cheap price if you want to make a class with certain things like Finnish nature or, or some kind of topic that is uh, current in your teaching so you can you can create the 3d content around that <laughs> um, could you please uh, talk a little bit about that workshop that you had in design museum when kids make these machines 
Oh. Like fear machines and oh, stuff. Oh, yes, these courage machines, yes. you mean. Okay. Yeah, it was a design week workshop two years ago. And uh, I was thinking that like the topic was uh, emotions or... I don't remember exactly, but like showing emotions or working with emotions. And I made this workshop where you could make a courage machine. So the the objects that I created for the workshop was this name tag that you can... Like you can put the name of the object and describe it, and it looks really official. So that was kind of the point. And then they had like cardboard and colorful tapes, and then some some like electronic parts taken out from the electronic devices. And the kids were creating these machines that were helping with their fears. Like for example, if you are afraid of dark, you could create a machine that that makes you not being afraid in the night. Or if you are afraid of uh, bullying people in school, you can you can make a device in your pocket that helps you with kind of dealing with that. And it was really interesting how the kids were, they were taking it really seriously, but playing at the same time. And I think it's something that like everybody should uh, do more, like creating stuff that helps you. I don't know, in men, uh, like, is it placebo or not? I have been, I'm not sure, but but surely it works. So it was a really interesting experience. <laughs> Hello, I'm Hannah from the Design Museum and we have a fantastic chance to work with so many designers and collaborate with so many designers. And I think quite often we uh, we can find uh, somehow the role of play in designers' work. So could you describe a bit what is the meaning of play in your own work? Um, in my own work, I think like involving people is a really important part. And I think play is the way to get others interested and then kind of getting more opinions or more mass in the things I do because then if you just make some kind of a game or create some rules then you don't need to know so much about the design so you can still do it and then it also it should be fun because otherwise people won't like they don't want to do it so basically if you make things so that they are interesting and kind of small bit uh, at the time so then anybody can be creative and do stuff and then we can kind of make together because I, I remember one time I was like BA second year in in school and I got really pissed off that I should be the one who decides what kind of bench I do and I remember that moment I was like ah oh, it's so boring <laughs> Like I have these ideas and they are, I think they are okay, but like it's really boring to do this alone. So then I made this workshop of uh, making snow uh, piles and then with shuffles you could make kind of spaces. And then it was the, uh, like how I researched the topic of the bench. And it was really interesting. My teachers didn't really understand it because <laughs> I was stud studying the furniture design. They were like, oh, are you in the wrong floor? <laughs> but, <laughs> but but yeah, that's my approach. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about the basic rules you use for these kinds of play workshops. Can you give us some examples of these kinds of rules that can not limit but set free creativity? Yeah, basically, for example, this rule of making the courage machine, I think it's a good example. So basically, the idea was think, think about something that makes you afri afraid and use these materials to make a tool to get over it and then label it and, uh, and that was it. And you can use it in any kind of things like... For example, if you would like to, like I made some workshops with children of like the, how they could uh, learn different way in school and then we were just uh, doing some like ideation with materials. So you can also do it that way that like just like takes certain time, for example, 20 minutes 
randomly doing stuff with these materials and then explain to others or maybe you can say so that some other can uh, interpret for example like how it looks for them because sometimes we explain our ideas but actually the other might interpret in a different way and then it's another idea so you can actually kind of you can use it that way that somebody does, does and another one explains but I don't know. Did it answer? Like, oh, yeah, okay. I have one question I'm thinking, I was thinking about. It's interesting what, about like roles and how you said already like in, in design school that you had the teacher saying like, no, you should actually do it like this and like, it's a bit scary. <laughs> like, and I was thinking about how, how like, the contradiction also with you work a lot with kids and adults and also I noticed in my own creative process as a photographer currently also like really like trying a lot of different things and then it's fun to see how it arises like 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 why, why am I doing this it doesn't make sense and and then like so it kind of it's, it's interesting like how we are kind of in a way socially programmed that that things has to have a meaning like, and you kind of have to know the meaning before you do things. And is, is this something you noticed um, is different with, with children? And I'm just like, is this a social kind of construction that, that in a way, like, like what, what you say to adults also, and, and I'm, I'm really, I get pissed off when I hear some adults say to kids that, like, why are you doing that? That that's, doesn't, that, that's like, you don't know even, you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> and like, that's, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> you don't have to know what you're doing. It's, it's life. <laughs> uh, what do, do you think there is, is like, is it is something about this kind of social so con con construct of, of, of kind of having, like how, how play and how like testing things, how it kind of, it becomes more difficult or how do you find, or do you see it already with kids that, that some, some have it more difficult to, to test things out? Many kids are really conservative actually. <laughs> It depends on the age, of course, like really young children, they are not kind of, they are not so interested about how, uh, how things should be in the world and they are kind of more open to test things and in some age they are really conservative, like when I ask like, how would the city look like if the children would have made it, because I think like, it's the same question than in like 100 years ago women couldn't be designing the society and the cities and now I think it's the same thing with kids, like we are not asking them actually, although they are the ones who are who are living here after us. But but they are like really like if we you ask kids like that, if you would uh, design the railway station, like how would it be? And they were like, uh, I wouldn't let children design it. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know what they are doing. And then I say like, okay, you know, adults don't know what they are doing either. So like uh, I think it's also about the time we live. Like in certain times it's more relaxed and now I think like trying out is okay also in, in the bureaucratic way like testing things and not everything has to be perfect. But I have been trying to say that like just like try to learn look backward like does it make sense in that way like if you step backward uh, is it a like, good process? Many times it is although forward it, it's not but yeah. Good, thank you. I know you need to leave, so let's, let's, let's stop it here. Thank you very much.